Good morning, ma. Good morning. Yeah, my name is Ronke, and thank you for accepting to participate in this project. Uh, and I want to start out by asking that you introduce yourself, tell me your name, and how you would like to be addressed. But first, as you tell me your name, I would also appreciate it if you could spell it so that we don't make any mistake. Well, my name is Bolanle Awe. My surname is Awe. My first name is Bolanle. And um, normally, I like to be addressed like that. Um, Mrs. Awe, or Professor Awe, whatever you like. Okay. Doesn't really matter much. Okay. Can you spell your names, like your first name and your last name? Yes, my first name is Bolanle, and it's B O L A N L E. And your last name? Uh, Awe, A W E. Very simple. All right, thank you so much. So uh, we're going to spend about uh, an hour or less yeah. on this conversation, and uh, I would just like to start with a uh, if you could tell me a little about your background. Thank you. Well, I, I, was, um, I was born and bred in this part of the country. Actually, I was born in a place called Ilesha. Uh, but my father comes from this town, Ibadan. My mother came from Ilesha. And that was where I went to school. I went to primary school there. When they decided to move to Ibadan, I also moved to Ibadan. And I finished my primary school here in Ibadan, in a, a school called St. James's School, Okebola. It's, it still exists and it's a big school. And that's where, from there, I went on to do my, uh, to undertake my secondary education in Lagos. I went to a school called CMS Girls School, Lagos. And uh, I'm proud to say that that school is 150 years old. It's the oldest girls school in Nigeria. And um, after some time, it was moved from Lagos to Ibadan. And with, uh, we made, joined another school here called um, Kudeti Girls School, which is a, it's a smaller school. And the school then became known as St. Anne's School, Ibadan. And uh, St. Anne's has been on since then, uh, about uh, not quite a month, not quite a week ago. We celebrated our 150th anniversary for those not only from Ibadan, but also those who came from Lagos. And it was a it was a it was a big affair. We had a big service in the church. Um, people came from all over uh, Nigeria. But also some of the old girls came from other parts of the, of, the, of the world. Some came from the US, some came from England, and all sorts of places. And it was a big, big celebration. And um, it, 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 was, it was fun to be part of it. Wow. It, was, it, was, it was really, really big. And uh, we were all so proud and happy about it because as I said, we, we were the first, almost the first set of girls to have the sort of secondary education that we had. Um, we were the very first set uh, to have what we call the school living certificate. And from there, we went abroad. Um, I went abroad with a number of my schoolmates who are, some of them are still around. There's uh, Professor Luri who is an ophthalmologist. Um, who are the other people? And I'm there and a number of us. Uh, we all went to s uh, secondary schools in Britain uh, to do our A-levels mm -hmm. and from there 
we went on to the university. I was in the secondary school in a school in Cambridge called the Perth School for Girls in Cambridge. That was where I did my A level. And from there, um, I went on to St. Andrews University in Scotland. Uh, it, 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 Saint uh, uh, the school, the university in in um, in in, in, in uh, at the pass, yeah. the university, the school was a very very highly competitive school. And to get into the pass itself was tough. Now to get from there to the university was even tougher. And there were only, I think, about two, uh, two women's colleges in the whole of the University wow. of Cambridge. And it was really tough to get in. And um, a number of us just decided that there was no point trying. <laughs> so. Uh, some went to Britain, to London, but I decided I didn't like London. I decided to go to Scotland, which I really liked. And I was in Scotland for four years. That was where I did my first degree. I read history and I, I really enjoyed being in Scotland. It was a very nice, it was, it's always been a very nice place, very friendly and the uh, the, the university was also very sociable, very friendly. And after, after that, um, I decided that the, the best thing for me was to try and do postgraduate level. I did my um, undergraduate level. I, I got my first degree in Scotland, in St. Andrews. Fortunately, my two professors in St. Andrews were from Oxford. And they, we got on very well, and they said, look, for postgraduate work, you have to go on to Oxford. So I went on to Oxford. I went to Somerville College in Oxford. There are about five colleges, women's colleges in Oxford. And Somerville, I think, is the oldest of the lot. And when I got there, I had to be interviewed by the History done. The, the woman who is in charge of history, oh. and uh, as I told her I wanted to do African history, and she just said nonsense that there's nothing like African history, and I said there is something like African history, and we argued about it for quite a while, and she said all she knew is that there's the history of Europeans in Africa which is different from African history. But fortunately for me, before I came to Oxford, I had read two books by two Nigerians, uh, Professor Kenneth D.K., who wrote on the Niger Delta, and Professor Saburi, Ab Saburi Abiyobaku, who wrote on the Egba. They, they were the first two Nigerians to write on, on um, African history and I was so excited that I actually wrote to the editor of the, 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 the paper which reviewed their books that I wanted to meet them and uh, he introduced me to Professor Biobaku and I started and Biobaku invited me to lunch and we talked and I said how did you go about doing what you are doing he told me how he did and he said look you too can do African history now. Mm. You, what well, I've done on the Egbas, you also can do on the Ibadans. And that was how I got to do on the Ibadans. And I went, I, when, I, when I got to Oxford, my history done was, uh, just thought I was wasting my time. Mm. And she said, look, we can't take you. If you say you want to do the history, colonial history, that is the history of uh, Europeans in Africa will be prepared to take you, but not the history of Africans in Africa. And she said sorry and dismissed me. But I was quite sure that there was something like African history after those two men. Mm -hmm. So I just went out. But a day or two after that, the in, in, a day or two after that, the um, 
the principal of the college uh, sent for me and said they wanted to see me. And I, I got there and she looked at me and said, look, Miss Fajib Bola, well, we have decided to give you a chance. Huh? We are going to admit you into this college. And I was surprised. Yeah, but uh, your history don't have just told me that there's no room for somebody like me. So he said, yes, I agree with her, but we like the way you stood your ground. Uh, I, I think that was my hallmark then. Wow. That I, that I, he said they were surprised that I was able to stand my ground even though I hadn't done any African history. <laughs> so he said what they have decided is to give me a chance and that I have to prove to them that there's something like African history. Huh? And so that was how I started um, African history in Oxford. And I was fortunate to have as my supervisor a lady called Marjorie Perham. You might have heard of Marjorie Perham. Mm -hmm. Marjorie Perham um, was uh, the lady who actually gave Nigeria its name. Oh. And uh, she, she was a very fierce, impressive woman. She knew so much about the history of Africa and so on. And uh, she was a consultant to the colonial office. And all the people who were going to be uh, working in the colonial office in one form or the other, even including people like Tom Mboya, uh, Tafa Balewa, and so on, they used to come to her college in Oxford, Northfield College, for consultation. And a number of and a number of us then this, she said that she was going to have a number of us as her students, her research students, and that was how I got to be Miss Perham's uh, student. It was not easy because there were about eight or nine, nine of us who were his stu her students, and she was so busy, and um, there was, and she was writing the history of the the biography of Lord Lugard at the time when we were she was supervising us, and she. She would, whenever we came for supervision, she would give us a chapter and say, look, go and read that chapter and give me your comment. And that was all the supervision we got. So some of he, her colleagues then started talking to me and said, well, how are you getting on with Miss Perham? So I told them, I'm not getting on with Miss Perham. All I'm doing is I'm doing, I'm writing, I'm reading the chapters on Lord Lugard. So she heard about it. And she said, look, I hear you've been talking about me. And you've told the people that I'm not supervising you. I'm just giving you chapters from Lugard's book. I said, but Miss Parham, that's the truth. She said, you are very naughty that now we are going to start working. <laughs> and we started working and she was, she was extremely nice and, um, she used to, um, she had a sister who had lived in East Africa who was extremely nice. So anytime I came for supervision, I would first have breakfast with them before the supervision. And after some time, Miss Pera thought I was getting too relaxed and she told, people, she told me that she's going to send me away, that normally students who come for uh, supervision come in their academic dresses, gowns. You just don't come on, and that the next time I come without my academic gown, she's not going to supervise me. So thereafter, I started and we became very good friends, and uh, she was very relaxed and very nice, though the, not the whole of the, 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 not everybody in Oxford was like that. We had a a group of us who were supposed to be learning uh, um, uh, West African history and so on. And um, the, some of our prof uh, professors didn't believe the, that those of us who were there supposed to be doing African history, they felt we were just wasting our time.
They were not interested in us. And the most terrible one was uh, pro pro somebody called Professor Halu. She was the, he was the overall boss. And uh, he would give you a paper to read, and you will read the paper. And then there'll be, he will comment on it, and everybody else will comment. And there was this day when one of our colleagues from Ghana, brilliant boy, very brilliant, uh, Isaac Tufo, he got a first class in, in Legon before coming to Oxford. He gave his paper, and Professor Harlow was supposed to make his comment. He refused to make any comment. He just kept quiet and kept quiet. We were all waiting, waiting for Professor Harlow. His uh, colleagues who were relatively junior also couldn't say anything. After some time, he turned to one of his colleagues and said, well, what's the paper for next week? Which means that this pap the paper for this week is a non-starter. Mm. And th that almost destroyed as Isaac Tufo because we all thought he was a brilliant, brilliant physicist. And in fact, most of the Ghanaians uh, too were very, very upset uh, that uh, this should happen to Isaac. But at that time, there was a lot of prejudice. Um, uh, Trevor, I don't know, the, Trevor Roper was another professor of history. And uh, he gave an interview on television. And he said that there's nothing like African history. That perhaps in the future, there might be African history but at the moment, there is no African history. The his there is nothing like African, and he dismissed the, the idea of African history on television. And that became known almost all over. Oh. And people were quoting it and quoting it. But anyhow, we struggled on and struggled on until we were able to, um, we, there was a library in Oxford, Rose House, which is Rose House Library where uh, a number of uh, African students uh, used to consult the books there and so on. And we had quite a group of us uh, who uh, used to go around together. And, uh, and we had a wonderful time there. There's, uh, uh, there was a, a professor of social anthropology, uh, which I thought we thought was very good in the sense that at least he taught about the anthropology of Africa and made us realize that it does exist. Mm -hmm. And, and um, well, there were a number of them like that that uh, made life interesting for us. And we, as a, some of our students, our uh, co-students were very fortunate. One of them, unfortunately, is gone now, mm -hmm. Professor Antonio. He was one of the most brilliant. He had a, a scholarship from uh, one of these uh, universities, and he uh, he had a very generous grant. So he used to take us along, and we would follow uh, Toji all over the place. And, uh, there was a there was a pub, not too far from Ruth's house, and not too far from my college either. And this pub, he would take us all there, and you would choose your drinks and choose whatever lab or flag or whatever you want and uh, he would pay for it and take us back to the uh, to the library and i remember i had the privilege of being taken by him to the union the Un oxford university union which at that time you as a woman you were not allowed into the union except you had a man to take you along and he took me along and I had, I had, I think I had lunch there, which was a great, great thing uh, in those days. But uh, we, we enjoyed, Ox we enjoyed uh, being in Oxford and um, being very free and talking, I mean, the, the, having all these other students who were also doing postgraduate work and we were all, uh, we were all struggling to prove that you can do African history. Um, okay. And we did, uh, after some time, I came home for field work. 
and then went back again and all that. So it, it was, um, by the end of it, it was great fun. And the principal of my college was extremely fond of me and he made sure that uh, I had to prove to them that there's African history, made sure that I got a grant so that I could go to London, the, the public records office to, uh, for my, for, to look at the records. And he, she arranged a grant for me from the college to do that. And uh, she also is made it quite important that I met a number of other students, especially non-Africans in the, in, the, in the college. And she would have cocktails and that was when I really decided to dislike cocktails because she would arrange cocktails and she would make sure that I attend the cocktail. And after I've talked to somebody for about five, 10 or five minutes, she would take me away and said, look, we had the long discussion with that one. Come and meet this one. Come and meet this one. And, uh, uh, but it, it, was, it, it was fun. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So you've said a lot of things. And then uh, talking about your getting into high school here and uh, how it was like the first girls' school. And then you want to even continue your graduate school um, you weren't going to be accepted somewhere, you had to go somewhere else. Would you say it, uh, girls' child education was late in coming in Nigeria? Um, it was not, it was, late, it was a bit late in coming, okay. but nevertheless, the, 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 some of the missionaries, like in my school, for instance, CMS Girls' School, they had started uh, girl child education and they were encouraging girls to come to school and but they were the first group of people mm -hmm. to encourage girls child education and I remember after that the some of the other people in Lagos led by Lady Abayomi, Lady Abayo, uh, Ademola and so on then went to protest to the government that there should be schools for girls, not only uh, that government should be responsible for it. And uh, there was a lot, lot of to do. I, don't, I can't remember the full details, but I have a feeling that uh, they also had to contribute money for that. And of course, it was not too long after that that the Methodists also started a girls' school, Methodist Girls' High School after the boy they had started one for the boys okay. so there it was a bit late coming but it came mm -hmm. and so in your reflections about your work for instance uh, what would you say were some central commitments to get uh, going uh, well my essential commitment was really to see that once I got Particularly when I when once I got into Cambridge at the purse that I I got on there. Unfortunately, I had two teachers, two history teachers who got on there, who liked me mm -hmm. and really encouraged me to uh, get on. And they would ask me questions, all sorts of interesting questions. What did I think about the Queen? Mm -hmm. Is it right that the Queen should be the head of the Commonwealth? And all sorts of interesting questions like that. And um, the principal of the school, Miss Scott, uh, was anxious that I should be able to speak good English. So she had, she used to organize lessons for me, just to make sure that I spoke good English and so on. And um, then they, en they encouraged me to travel outside Cambridge. You know, first of all, even to get acclimatized in Cambridge itself. Um, uh, crick I didn't know anything about cricket, but they told me that this was one of the games that they played in, Cam in Cambridge, and they decided to take me for cricket, well, I think almost every week. One of the teachers will go with me and they will tell me all the mechanisms of the playing cricket on the cricket field. And then they also 
encouraged me to do a little bit of work on classical music that I should also know something about classical music and also about European art and one of my lecturers actually organized that I should go to Italy and see the um, what was going on in Italy as the, the, the European art that was being displayed in Italy and I, and I went there and she also made me write an essay on that. So there was that sort of exposure right, left and centre just to make sure that I also, I, I, I wasn't just in, um, in um, Cambridge or anywhere just for that purpose, that I had to learn about other people as well. Yeah. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, between your work and those uh, around you, what would you say were like uh, the most uh, significant life achievements professionally for you? When? Li work life now. Yes. Professionally, what would you say were like some most significant achievements now well, that you are retired, you know, just looking well, back? I'm glad that I, that I was able to... Uh, be a historian and uh, be firm about it and be proud of the fact that I'm a historian and that we could talk, I could talk about it and, uh, and, and, and also that uh, I had a lot of friends who were also historians who were classmates. Some of them were with me in St. Andrews, some of them were in Oxford with me and uh, some of them actually came back to Nigeria with me and started uh, teaching here. Mm -hmm. I had a friend, Jenny Dob Dobbin, who was a... Uh, she... we both read history in Oxford, we read history in Cambridge, and uh, she was... Uh, mm -hmm. she was uh, extremely keen on history, and uh, when she got here, she decided to go to one of the uh, colleges here in the uh, University of Ibadan, where she did more and more history until she eventually, I don't know what happened, she, she eventually went back. Okay. But uh, I got to, we became very friendly and also she got to know my, my relations, my brother, my mother and my other relations. They were, and just as I also got to know her relations. Her father was a farmer and uh, he was a huge man oh. and he had a very generous appetite and he would uh, really give us big slices of meat, you know. The British don't eat too much meat but he would make sure that he gave us good slices of meat and all sorts. So I, I really enjoyed uh, their presence, yeah. Okay. So let's move to your work now. Uh, what would you say actually drew you to the kind of work mm. you began to do as you started to teach? Mm. I can't hear what you asked. I said, what specifically can you say drew you to the kind of work mm. you started to do when you, when you began to teach? Um, well, when I began to teach, there were different... Uh, I, I didn't begin to teach until I came back okay. to Nigeria when I was in the Department of History and uh, I must say it was a tough assignment because I even though I had done postgraduate work in history and so on I hadn't really done much work in history par in African history part C but um, I was in this department, Department of History here in Ibadan, which was one of the oldest departments of history. And you just had to learn to be able to uh, do, to know what history is all about. And I remember, this was very interesting, uh, the head of department at one point, Abdullah Smith, he was an Englishman, but uh, he, he had done a lot of African history and so on. And 
he, even when I was in Oxford, he had shown interest in me coming to teach there. And he suggested that the best thing for me would be to do a little bit more African history before starting to teach. And he, the, he used to teach the most senior students in history. And he suggested to me that perhaps if I liked, I could come and sit at the back of his class so that I could pick up more information, which was very nice of him. And uh, I started doing that. But of course, the students thought it was because my history was inadequate and that I wasn't really yet ready for that. And um, I, I, I was staying in, a, in a, one of the halls of residence. And I used to walk from the history department to the place. And some of the students will come and walk along with me. Not really <laughs> because they were that charming, but, but they just wanted to know how competent I was, and they would uh, they would they would ask me, "What are uh, what are you doing?" Uh, you know, try to find out whether I really knew enough history or didn't know enough history. But um, that that was an interesting period. But I also had a set of students, young students, who uh, I was asked to uh, teach at the very beginning. And uh, I really enjoyed that because they were all students from really first class uh, <laughs> students uh, schools in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And they came and um, I decided I was going to give them something like a, a ment I would like to mentor them and we will sit together I'll give them an essay, they will write it, and then I'll ask them to comment. I will all speak to it, and they enjoyed that, that I was able to, and I said, look, don't be afraid, just say what you feel. And they enjoyed that, and I must say, a number of them did well. In fact, a few of them became professors later. I think that there's even one right now in the, here in, uh, in Ibadan, he's a professor, uh, not of history, economics, but uh, he started off as a professor of history, but they all used to say that I was a bit hard on them, that, uh, that, 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 mark, that I was not generous with my marks and so on. But uh, we got on extremely well, we became very good friends, and they all became, there's a one of them who is also in IFE, he's a professor of history in IFE. One was in ABU, and we all got on very well. Okay, so for instance, will you say your work mm -hmm. uh, is shaped by your life experiences? Well, yes, in a way, yes. My, uh, my and work, how? Um, my work, how my, my work was shaped by, my, well, as I told you earlier on, the idea of even wanting to do history, that was a life experience. Uh -huh which uh, shaped my, uh, my work. Okay. But apart from that, was the fact that uh, I had to show that uh, uh, it became a mission for me to show that there's something like African history and that we've got to talk about it. We've got to make people realize that there's African history and make people appreciate it and um, uh, it, 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 and of course, when I started doing my own postgraduate work, especially I specialized in the history of Ibadan, mm -hmm. and that was a very exciting thing for me because I Ibadan was one of the uh, is, is w it has been and um, up to now one of the largest towns in in Nigeria. It, and it was a, it was a, it was a town which uh, was able to be a, a defense station against other groups of people, like the, like those in the north, 
who uh, who uh, defeated part of the what we used to know as the Oyo Empire, mm. destroyed them, and some of the people came down south. Some of them settled in Ibadan, and so. And uh, in fact, when there was another attempt to drive them away, it was the Ibadan people at Oshobo who came together and drove away the people from the north. And uh, that uh, w was a tremendous thing. And uh, I've, al I've always been very proud of the fact that Ibadan is such a, a large town, a town which has achieved so much in so many ways. And as some, I think somebody was talking to me yesterday or day before, it's one of the largest towns around here. And uh, one is extremely proud of it that uh, one could live in a town like this mm -hmm. and that the town could develop as it has developed. Yeah. Um, anytime I have visitors, I take them to Mapo Hall. I make them go to the very top and see the whole of the town. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I go to Bowers Tower, which is even higher up, to let people see just how big Ibadan is. And um, then I, make, I, we drive round, mm -hmm. yes. especially the old part of Ibadan. It's, uh, it's, it's impressive when you drive round the old part. If you come down from Mapoho and you are going towards, um, um, well, you're going down on the right, you'll be amazed about the size of the town. The, ta the the houses, the the villages, and so on. You just be amazed that there's so much. And then on the left, you will see all sorts of uh, traditions and things. People make um, uh, there's a place where they make uh, we call it asude. That's where um, what do you, what do you call the asudes? The people who uh, help to <laughs> they do all sorts of things with the with uh, I can't, can't remember but uh, it's it's very it's it, yeah, the Asudes are very important for Ibadans as warriors they provided all the war in war implements there's a place where on the left as you go towards Bata on the left you see the place where these uh, Asudes are, and they, they make all the war implements that one could possibly want. Wow, and, that's uh, very interesting. So mm -hmm. uh, you, are, you are called the doyen mm -hmm. of feminism in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how that relates with you standing your ground to study African history, as well as being called very naughty, because very naughty. In Not terms it. of what you wanted to do, you know, what's that connection between your work and then uh, these previous uh, observations about you? Well, um, it's interesting that you're asking that question. Uh, for me, it didn't really, I, I didn't think too much about it. Huh? I really didn't think too much about it because I, I knew that. Um, the, it's the, all that came from my background. My mother was a teacher and she was one of the very first set of teachers uh, in, 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 uh, in this part of the country. The United Missionary College, there were, she was one of those very first set to be teachers there. And so I was always proud of the fact that I had a mother who was well versed mm -hmm. and uh, who could, uh, and she encouraged, she was very encouraging. She, she made sure that you went to the right schools and so on. And okay. uh, for instance, she was the one who took me to CMS Girls School. I remember the very first day I went, she took me there the boarding house 
and my mother was so anxious she helped me to make my bed and all sorts and people were looking at me that this girl must be a little bit spoiled so the following the after the when the holidays were coming i knew she would also try to come so i told i told her i told her i told my principal that please can you send a telegram to my mother to the effect just the telegram mother not needed i can cope when Miss Wade was an English woman, saw it, she laughed and uh, said, Mother not needed, I can cope, and sent it like that to my mother, that my mother didn't have to come to Lagos, that I can cope, I can get from Ibadan, uh, from Lagos to Ibadan. And, we, and it, was, it wasn't difficult because there were other people going to Ibadan, and we were going to to the railway station at Ido, and from there there were a lot of school children, and we would we had wonderful times together. And some of us who, as we grew older, and we looked as if we were having boyfriends, some of the boyfriends would uh, is offer to take your luggage for you, and uh, to be naughty, just to try them out, you make sure that the luggage is so heavy so that they, they, they start regretting the fact of offering to take your luggage for you but there's nothing they can do about it because you can't at that point they can't say they can't take it because it means that they are weak so we'll go to the uh, rail, uh, Ido railway station and from there I'll go to a battle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Interesting. So uh, talking about uh, your work uh, how would you uh, kind of capture your engagements in feminist academic work and activism in Nigeria? Yeah. Well, um, about this, the, the, I, I, I really do, the, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing how one just, it was, it was almost as if one drifted into it, but you did, uh, for one thing, I was lucky, one, in the sense that I went to those colleges, especially the Oxford ones. They, they, it, there's no doubt about it that they were female colleges and they made sure that you did well. And of course, then being taught by Miss Peram was also another plus. Um, it showed the, so that uh, right from that very beginning, I, was, I knew that I was going to uh, try and be well, what you like, could be something like a feminist. And of course, um, at the Perth uh, School for Girls in Cambridge, the two teachers who taught me were also uh, very much feminist, and they 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 wanted to know, they wanted to encourage me in that in that field, and. Um, when one got to St. Andrews, there was no, there wasn't too much discrimination when one got to St. Andrews. The two professors, although they were from Oxford, they were very generous, very liberal, and we used to chat with them and so on and so forth. And as I told you, they were the ones who encouraged me to go to Oxford, that there's no point staying, uh, staying on in St. Andrews. Here if I wanted to do postgraduate work in the field in which I wanted to do postgraduate work. Okay. And of course, once one go to um, Oxford, it's a, it's a very different story because um, apart from, the, 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 as I told you, uh, uh, the, the university, the, the the library, the library I went, Rhodes House Library, so it was a mixed library. All of us were there together, and we were all competing. Mm -hmm. And and then, then we had um, the social anthropology s school there, where we also we, we were also many African students who were being taught social anthropology. That also helped us. And there was another college nearby where we were taught um, 
um, well, African history. But what is important, what I thought was important was the fact that one was able to assert that it is not that it's, it, uh, history, uh, uh, learning is not just about men, it's about men and women. Mm. And that we also can do as well as the men. And that uh, we should not, uh, there, should be, there should be no reason why one should be um, afraid of uh, projecting oneself and speaking out at the right time. And all the time I was in St. Andrews, fortunately I had professors who encouraged you to speak out. They would call you sometimes and say, look, Ms. Fajimbola, you are the one going to give the vote of thanks, or uh, we want you to comment on X and Y. So that you, by then, you got confident that, well, there's no big deal about being a woman or being a man. And uh, as I said, when I was thinking of going to do postgraduate work. The, my two professors just said, "Look, you must go, I, we must go to Oxford." I was I was going to a teacher training college in Cambridge, and they said, "Absolute nonsense! That you are going to a, a, a postgraduate college." Oh. And they both of them then wrote the references oh. for me. So, yeah. uh, so I, what I hear you saying specifically is that when given the opportunity, yes, women can do it. Oh, yes. Why okay. not? Okay. Because it's coming out very clearly from uh, your responses. So for that, I'm just wondering what specifically your focus has been in terms of uh, um, your engagements as a historian. Well, as I said, the... As a historian, I was very interested in the, 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 the history, not only of uh, Ibadan, but the history of women. And I have written a few things about them. But apart from that, um, one of my favorite women is uh, Yalo de Epusheto. She was a fierce, tough woman. She was a... Uh, the Yellow Day was the leader of the women, and uh, she was uh, extremely hardworking, very wealthy, and very fierce. And uh, the men didn't really like her too much, uh, but she she didn't seem to mind unduly. And when it looked as if they were uh, trying to undermine her. She stood up. Uh, we had uh, uh, the head of the town. Can you remember the head of uh, Arelatosa? He was the head of Ibadan. He was a very powerful soldier and so on, very well known. But he wanted everything to be done his own way. But Efunsheta felt it was getting too much, that there was too much warfare, that they should set, step it down a little bit. But he refused. So um, there was a time she was very wealthy, and she would lend them um, soldiers to go to war. And the, the soldiers would come back with boots and all that. Uh, but after some time, when he felt that they were, she felt they were not listening, she refused to allow them to take her soldiers to war. And of course, uh, there was real trouble after that. She was, uh, she was attacked. She was called all sorts of names. And there was a time when it was alleged that uh, she was the one causing a lot of the trouble in Ibadan. And uh, more or less, they tried to push her away. And they, they said that, her, that uh, she, she didn't have a child. And they said, because she didn't have a child, 
she was not a nice woman, particularly to her female uh, servants. And it was alleged that one of them died and that she must have had a hand in it, which I don't think she did. So they attacked her and virtually mobbed her house and virtually destroyed her house. But Yaleh uh, de for a long time stood her ground. Uh, her, her house in Ibadan still exists. If you go to Mapo now, very near um, the Ulubadan's present house and also um, near the, uh, the mosque, and the place where uh, the chief who installs uh, people and gives them the traditional uh, 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 thing to make them chiefs. The, 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 the house where sh that chief lives is next door to Efusheton's house. And Efusheton still has a big, big garden, a big uh, um, as a place where her people still live and she's still she's still very well known yeah, mm. very interesting but uh, she was yeah. she was also she was always my favorite because of the way she stood up uh, the, the, the uh, really wanted to finish her but uh, she, the awareness of the fact that she did he did a lot of her work to her she still stood up she stood her grounds and uh, maintained her reputation within the town of Ibadan, even up till today. Wonderful. Yeah, so uh, for you, uh, you said it was like you almost stumbled into feminist work. Yes. But for you, what do you understand by feminism? Well, <laughs> as a, it's a tough one. Um, I almost, almost also stumbled into it. I knew that uh, it was important to emphasize the fact that women also had a contribution okay. to our history. I think this is extremely important. And um, I think the th it, this really hit me hard when we went for the, uh, the conference in the, you know, the, the, conf the, the conf there were two conferences but the, there was a big one and then there was a small one and I went with the MacArthur Foundation and uh, um, it was there that one got to know about the importance of feminism and the, the fact that w the women also have to stand up for themselves. We just had to we had to stand up for the ourselves. And there was this woman, I think from the, who, uh, I, she came from one of these islands. She, I remember my husband went there. <laughs> there, are those, there are two photographs there in our sitting room, which he brought back. But, uh, the, the the women were the, 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 he he spoke he, he got very impressed by the women there mm. and of course I must say that when I um, I went to Cuba and I saw that in Cuba uh, it is true that there were many more men and they were but they didn't prevent the women from coming up in their own too and speaking up for themselves. And I remember the, uh, the, the, uh, the, they invited me to, uh, no, the, the, the NIPS, I don't know whether you've heard of NIPS. NIPS is uh, this uh, group that uh, goes, uh, is selected by the government civil servants and so on and they go all right around the whole country 
on the, also not only in in uh, the country but all over the world and I was I, I don't know what I went to do in Cuba I think I, 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 we, I, I got him friendly with the, the Cuban ambassador here also he encouraged me and said oh you can go to Cuba they speak English and so on so I found my way there and uh, but and then I found this group of Nigerians and they, we started talking together and in the end they said look why don't you join us because I was alone and uh, and they the government was very generous to them they treated them very liberally I was just a poor relation but they invited me to join them and I joined them and um, and we started talking about Cuba and what uh, what uh, what uh, one can achieve in Cuba, and found that in fact Cuba was a, a, a it was a very important place, though uh, not as l important as people uh, thought, because the. The president of Cuba then, I can't, I can't remember his name, he had just gone and whoever was there was not as uh, strong. And I remember I, I was going to go back to the US and I had to go through uh, Haiti and I stopped in Haiti and that was where I bought this. Um, and uh, we went uh, and, and it was difficult, they, first of all they were not too keen that I, a woman should be doing all this traveling on her, by herself but I said look it's my business and I'm uh, here. Yeah. So uh, I went through Haiti and then on to uh, the US and I felt there was no big deal about traveling anywhere that uh, uh, I can I can move uh, to any place that I wanted to, and um, the, the the and the universities were were open. Okay. They were open and they were friendly. Um, um, yeah, that was it. So yeah. I. You did say that uh, your husband uh, was impressed by the fact that. Uh, the Cuban women had the freedom to relate and do what they wanted to do. Yeah. Um, just thinking about that, uh, being married to him, uh, and then this talk about African feminism. What's your take on um, African feminism? Well, uh, fortunately, um, my my husband was as uh, open. As I was, we uh, he he went to government college, which is one of the oldest colleges here. Whilst I was at Saint Anne's, and uh, we the, those of us from Saint Anne's did have, had no fear of any man or any student, male student or anything. We used to have uh, debates with them, interviews with them, and we would sometimes even uh, floor them and um, then he, when he, he, he and when I go to St. Andrews I met a number of his uh, uh, schoolmates like uh, Ululoyo, uh, Victor Omolulu Ululoyo and late uh, Professor Ladapo. We were all there, we were all in the university together and they, they were from government college of ours from uh, CMS girls school but we related without we, there was no no feeling that one was uh, that he's a man and I'm a woman and all that ah. and uh, I remember uh, professor Aladapo was the one who introduced me to my husband and he uh, we were Aladapo was a very good friend of mine. He was in St. Andrews and he was going back to St. Andrews. I, he has still had a year more. So I said, look, let me see you off at the 
railway station at King's Cross. So I went to see him off. And lo and behold, my husband was also there to see him off. So he introduced us. And, and, and that was how it started. And my husband had a, a car, a small car called Anike. It's a very small car, which he said he bought from his uh, supervisor for 25 pounds. And he gave me a lift to in Anike to the, the, the hostel where I was staying. And from there, he used to come and see us and wow. be friends with us day in day out. And, uh, and that was how uh, the uh, it started. And uh, when um, and he was in Cambridge, I was in Oxford, and we used to meet in London. And, uh, and he, the, the, they were more lively than the rest of us. That's very interesting, especially for the fact that these days there's a lot of stigma about matchmaking. Would you say that that was matchmaking? No, I, I don't think it was. Well, I, I oh, is there anything bad in you know a friend introducing you to your spouse? No, now? I don't think it was matchmaking, but I think well, it may be another for was uh, trying to be to be matchmaker, but I I just felt another for was my friend, and I, and therefore decided to go uh, to to see him off just for fun especially as we were both from St. Andrews and that, that was how, uh, but I don't think he, I'm not sure he knew much more about it thereafter. Okay, Though just the next day he saw that uh, the relationship had... Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, okay. the, 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 well I, we kept on meeting mm -hmm. in, in London, All the, we used to have parties in London and this and that and we kept on meeting there and uh, thereafter uh, the, 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 there was a time when I think when my husband said well he had a few friends that I must meet them and they're all in London so I went to meet them people like uh, well another Paul was one of them Walesha Yuka was one of them there were a few of them who he introduced me to Ake Kube, he said, if you are going to be anything to me, these are my friends. And I, and I went to meet them, we chatted and so on. And that Interesting. was it. Interesting, yeah. It mm. looks like you had a lot of uh, yes. more of male friends growing up uh, uh, yes. than uh, even uh, female friends. But then I wanted us well, to also... I had a lot of female friends too. Okay. I have a lot of, I mean, somebody like Professor Luri. Okay. Yeah, Mrs. you mentioned Shani. that. Yeah. They were my, they were very good friends and uh, quite a number of other mm -hmm. friends which I, I can't, can't okay. remember their names now. So, but for you, how would you, uh, well, how do you perceive the relationship between scholarship and activism, act, act, uh, that's female, scholars, uh, female scholarship and activism? Huh? That's feminist scholarship and activism now. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I, I think they should they go together, and that um, female. Uh, I, I, I didn't see any big deal in female scholarship and uh, activism at all. Yeah. I feel that um, if you have the ability, use it wherever you can use it. Mm -hmm. Not uh, and that. Um, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know. Okay, so let's. Uh, 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 how would you define African feminism? What is African feminism? Well, the, you people <laughs> have been making so much about African feminism. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a tough thing, okay. for one thing. Uh, right from the very beginning, one could even say that our women had in their own way been feminist. They had their own views. They had they, they knew their mind. They knew how to express themselves. They were not prepared to be pushed aside by anyone. They and so the the the, 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 the 
uh, we've always felt that we can also do it that whatever any man can do a woman too if she tries hard enough can do it and there's no there's no big deal about it okay. and for that what, what, what will be the intersection of your work therefore with the women's movement globally for instance well i don't know about globally but uh, i know that uh, we we were interested in uh, the women's research and documentation center okay. yeah. and that was uh, really one of the areas in which i had a push okay. i was interested and yeah. um, and uh, one felt uh, and we had contacts with people not only in Nigeria or even Africa but outside uh, with people we can talk to we can discuss with and uh, and uh, who also feel that perhaps we have something to offer yeah. so that's uh, and for you, therefore, what would, how would you describe the progression of women movement in the last two, three, four decades in Nigeria, for instance? Well, there's been a lot of progress within the last... Uh, there certainly has been a lot of progress, and I think there still is a lot of progress. And um, th that's why, for instance, uh, we, keep, we still encourage all sorts of uh, 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 project programs like the WADOC uh, undertakes and other institu institutions like that. Not only WADOC, but other institutions also undertake programs which uh, show that uh, we're still, we, we feel that there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay and that people should still be encouraged to uh, interact with other people, um, not only within Nigeria or Africa, but outside, okay. to find out what exactly uh, what is happening and whether we are making any progress or we are standing still okay. and what we can do and that was part of the interest of uh, WODOC to start with. We, we, when we started, we, um, we got interested in a number of uh, institutions outside Africa, for instance in Canada. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the, 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 the is it SIBA? SIDA. Uh, SIDA. Um, they actually encouraged us, made sure that we got the right books, um, encouraged uh, us also to, uh, some of our people went abroad to Canada to see what they're doing there. And we also encouraged them to see what we are doing here. Okay. Um, Interesting. So I promise this would be my very last question. You know, you already mm -hmm. answered part of it in terms of uh, uh, your vision for the Women's uh, Research Development Center. And I, I was just thinking, uh, what specifically you think uh, the global climate change has to do with feminism, for instance? Global, uh, the global climate change? Yes. And, and feminist movement? Well, uh, well, I, I, <laughs> well, that's a tough one in the sense that I thought the global family, uh, climate change is a, it's a serious matter, which uh, it, and it, it's, it goes beyond feminism. It touches almost all of us in, in the world. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that the women have a particular stand that they, they are taking over it. Except, well, I suppose if people are already beginning to think about the climate and the effect of the climate on people, but whether the climate affects only the women or whether it affects everybody, 
and how do we re respond to that climate change. But uh, on the other hand, I think you're right in the sense that there are certain aspects of the climate which affect the women. And perhaps we should start thinking in terms of it. But at the moment, it doesn't look as if we are doing much in that respect. Thank you very much for yes. participating in this interview. We are very grateful. We appreciate you. And um, this interview has held on this last day of October 31, 2019. Okay, I you. wish you all the best. I wish you well. And we yeah. really do appreciate you. Well, I thank wish you, you all the very best. I, I thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of your project and program. Uh, I'm sure it will be quite interesting and, uh, and I hope that you will let Wodok know the, uh, what your findings are ultimately Certainly. So, and also how in, in what way we can also participate in the development. All right. Thank you, ma. Yeah, thank you. Good work.